be like, hold the fort, put on the brakes, what's going on? But this is the first year that the students have been tested, assessed in this way. It's a one minute test for grades three to six, and then it's uh, more phonemic awareness and uh, letter identification for K1 and two. Um, so we're not reacting strongly to this. We have identified each student who falls in one of the red areas and we have um, interventions in place. So not gonna bite my nails just yet. I'm, I, I'm holding out and I um, completely believe in the programs that we're using. Uh, the third through sixth grade will be taking the NIWA within the next four weeks. I'll give you the results after um, at the next meeting. And then I listed some activities that um, things that we've been up to at Conway Grammar School. Uh, sixth grade had a pasta dinner for their nature's classroom trip. We um, we were late to the to coming, but we decided we wanted to, we've had so many new families this year and every year, actually, we did um, 23 welcome bags to our new families. We handed those out in December kind of as a midway point, but um, that's something we've want, been wanting to do for a little while. So we had lots of donations and we filled up little bags, which was great. We had our concert, we had our steam day. Reading with the Red Hawks is a huge, um, huge, uh, we have a huge fan base for that at Conway. The Frontier Band came and performed, and boy, are they unbelievable. They're doing Mar Mama Mia in March, which we're excited to go to. Um, grade 5 is going to the Springfield Museum. We're having a math day this month. Very busy at Conway Grammar School, as usual. But things are going great. Our role is up. Children are great. Staff's great. Families are great. And thank you for the best job ever. Didn't we have, do dibbles before, like before you got there? Yes, you did, Elaine. Yeah. Because I think Claire did that. Yes, yes. You dibbled, okay. dabbled in dibbles. Yes. Dabbled in dibble. Yep. <laughs> and the Springfield Museums, I think, are free on the first Wednesday of the month. Just oh, if you, if you want to look it up, they're running some promotion that I think it's Wednesday, the first Wednesday of every month, they're all free. Oh, good to know. Didn't know that. Currently, it's $11 per student, which isn't terrible. We'll pick up any one who is not able to pay it. But it's nice to hear free. Free is good. On to Maggie. Yeah. Yeah, just look at it. It's, I'm sure it's on their websites. Great. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right. Any questions for Kristen? Nope. Just excited to hear about all the stuff. All righty. Uh, I haven't gotten to the newsletter yet, but I will. I appreciate you sending it to us. So much um, stuff there. It's great. Uh, any public? I don't think we have any public for comment. Speak now or forever hold your comment. All right. We're good. Um, and now we're on to unfinished business. We have to vote policies AAA1 1 ACA. BGF and CHCA, which we were presented with at the last meeting. So we've had time to review. So I need a vote, a motion uh, to approve. I'll make a have questions, comments. But. Uh, sorry, I was trying to look at the what, how specific do we need to be about those? Sorry. Yeah, it's hard because we don't have them right in front of us. Uh, I'll take a I'll take a motion for approving the policies we reviewed last month. I'll make a motion to approve the policies as read. All right. I'll, I'll second. All right, uh, and we'll roll call. Uh, Phil. Yeah. All right, Michael. Yes. Denise. Yes. Jared? Yes. And I'm in favor of approving policies AAA-1, ACA, BGF, and CHCA. Uh, now we need a vote to remove BK, which I don't remember what BK was. Uh, there is. What was BK? You can have it your way. <laughs> <laughs> it I, knew, I knew I was opening myself up. Yes, the uh, <laughs> school committee memberships. It's a useless policy that says you're allowed to have memberships with committee associations and take part in the activities of these groups. Yeah. Okay. You don't need that. All right. Can I have a motion to vote to remove BK? I'll make a motion to vote to remove BK. I'll second. 
All righty. And uh, roll call. Uh, Denise? Yes. Jared? Yes. Michael? Yes. Phil? Yes. And I am also a yes, so it's unanimous. And now we have the fun stuff, the superintendency agreement. Uh, we met as a Union 38 committee. I assume Frontier met. And um, we have approved an agreement uh, or have talked about an agreement to present to you all, um, which hopefully you reviewed. And um, we would like to lock Darius up for a few more years. Not literally, just figuratively. <laughs> so I, I would seriously uh, just like to amend the agreement to make it a lifetime contract. But <laughs> other than I tried that. So seriously. in the Love negotiations, that. I tried to extend Love it. it. But... So this is not my agreement. This is the agreement in which the process you used at that oh, joint right. meeting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. My agreement's at the joint meeting. My agreement's at the joint meeting. So. Okay, I was jumping, jumping ahead. All right. So to vote the policy that we've already sort of moved by. Okay. <laughs> Get us in compliance. Right, well, now you have that procedure. Should yes, you need great. to use I it, like you got to, when you got a dry run on that. And it was good, actually. Sure. It was yeah. very, good, very good procedure. I was participating in it. So a vote to a motion to uh, put the superintendency agreement into motion. I'll make a motion for All righty. The, the superintendency agreement. And a second. A second. Yeah. All righty. Uh, and roll call. Jared? Yes. Denise? Yes. Michael? Yes. Phil? With gratitude and deep appreciation, yes. Okay. And uh, myself. I, yes, it's unanimous. Although we still, we have to vote on the actual agreement. This was just on the process. Thank you for that correction, Darius. Mm -hmm. All righty, new business. I assume this is you, Darius, equity plan overview and report. Yep. Um, I was just gonna share my screen. So, um, you know, before you use the equity plan, and the best way to just to explain the equity plan is how it exists with other plans. And so, um, you know, you did, we did send this out, you did have a chance to review it, for, but for those watching and wondering um, what we're talking about, is the equity plan basically is one of the four plans that drives the decision making in our district. And it's more of a static plan, meaning we're not going to be changing it year to year. I mean, we can certainly change it if we want to. Um, but it's a plan that um, works with the curriculum management plan, the professional development plan, the assessment management plan, and then you have the equity plan. And so when you read through the document, you can really see how um, these four plans work together. There's a lot of cross-referencing between the, the four plans. And those plans are used to make the strategic plan for the district. Um, and then from the strategic plan, which is a three to five year plan, and basically we kind of update it every year and kind of um, you know, check off what we've been getting done and that kind of stuff. And then we have our annual PD calendar, our school proven plans that obviously comes from that you guys approve um, and the, the equity action steps, which was that. Philip, that document. I'm sorry I'm on this meeting. I love I love the fact that it's on Zoom and you can mute yourself and put your take your picture off and you can pretend that you're there. Just keep an ear when you need to be there. Bill, you got to mute yourself. Oh, I'm used to. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to pretend to be here. Um, and equity, and then we have the equity action steps, which are the um, was that bigger, that colorful document that kind of showed what we made for everything from the equity audit. We kind of made a made multiple year plan, but those are the equity equity action steps that are um, going to be updated each year. All right. Um, so I, I do want to thank Sarah Mitchell and Laura um, for putting together. Um, they did the they did the lion's share of this work, and um, and 
I just want to thank them for it, Laura Ramsey and Sarah Mitchell for doing that. But that's basically how it all fits together. Because I think without this kind of graph, it kind of like, what are all these plans and how are they working and what are we improving and how does this affect things going forward? And the idea is that our equity work is going to be ingrained in what we do. So, for example, um, Kristen was just talking about UFLY. You know, UFLY is a, is a you know, is a, is a, uh, a learning system that is that has equitable values in it. It makes sure that all learners are represented and that kind of thing, and, and it scores very well in that. And so that's one of those things we look for by exercising the equity plan as we exercise the curriculum management plan, those two things come together. So you can see how um, the values of that. Um, so that's kind of where it is overall. Is there, I mean, I'm not gonna read you the plan, obviously, you have it in front of you. It's kind of straightforward, but um, I think it's quality, I think it's good stuff. How do you feel buy-in is with this plan? So the buy-in really, the administration really uses this. So, you know, and obviously, we, not obviously, but we do have complete buy-in from the administration about getting this work instead of having committee work that's pushing it in, that it is part of the other things that we're doing. Um, and so we haven't, we've kind of back built it because we're doing all these things. But this is really, I mean, these kind of, these four plans are really not for, they're, I mean, they're for me, but they're for when you have transition in people and so that you you are consistent in how you are approaching um, all these things. So if new leadership comes in in any of the positions, they can see, oh, this is how we put things together. This is how the different parts work together. And so it creates accountability when you create your you know, next strategic plan, how are you putting that together? Is equity a part of it? Instead of, oh yeah, remember we did that work a few years ago? Um, we gotta make sure we did that, or we have a policy on that. This is kind of saying, did we follow that? Um, and we can be called the task if we don't. And that's kind of what we want. Excellent. Other questions, thoughts? Just thankful we have it. Definitely a good step. Um, all righty. We are on to our next set of policies. Our first reading of EEAEC, EEAG, GBI, GCA, GCK, G. This is like an eye test. Yeah. Elaine, you know what I could do is I have a, a, a quick cheat sheet that I can kind of just go through and it will help you digest them. And then I think if, if I have two minutes, to just run through them. Great. It'll give you the Love two it. minutes to digest them. And then um, obviously this is the first reading. So if you have questions and stuff, you can hit me up between now and the next meeting. The next Perfect. Meeting. All right. I don't need an eye test. Right. EEAEC is also JICC. is a cross-reference about student conduct on buses. Okay. So we don't have that cross-reference. So it's a new policy. E, I'm just going to flow right along, so just kind of like like town meetings, say hold if you want me to go back to that. EEAG is student transportation and private vehicles. It's an updated language around Corey checks to make sure that if we're, you know, parents are volunteering or anybody um, is transporting students, they are Corey checked. BGI, staff participant, we do that. By the way, we already do that. It's just It's just making sure we're getting this in policy. BGI is staff participation in political activities. Um, basically, it spells out that staff can participate in political activities outside of the workday and outside of the building, but not as, as part of their employment. DCA is professional staff position. This is a new policy. Basically, it says that new positions have to be approved by school committee and that we need to have a drop description of those positions. Um, again, which we do, I would say, the majority of the time, but this will hold us to it. GCK is professional staff assignments and transfers. This is a new policy, but follows the current practice of you know how teachers are assigned um, or staff are assigned those their positions by the principal. GDB is staff support, support staff contracts and compensation plans. This is also a new policy. Um, it does follow our current practices. We do have um, uh, we do have uh, handbooks and stuff that that spell all this out. In this, we you know we will relate to that. HB is negotiation of legal status. Um, it's just legal language about negotiations that they say we should have in our policy. Don't really know when that would come up, but if they say we should have it, and it's kind of legal jargon, we should put it in there. J 
JF is school admissions. Um, this follows our current practices, but basically explains how we do admissions into school uh, at the kindergarten level. JFBB is school choice for the elementaries, and basically it has the dates of when we have to make our decisions by. We normally make our decisions well before those dates, but it does have a timeline in when you have to make those decisions by, and that there's a lottery system and such um, if there are not enough spaces at that time. And then JFBB-1 is just the FR, is the frontier school choice with different dates because they, they go a little bit earlier. All righty. Any questions? So we're going to read them between now and the next one, and we're going to vote at the next meeting. Correct. And the policy committee is still meeting, so you'll probably have another stack that you're going to be doing the first read while the second read. It's going to be a year of that. And these are all, um, again, we're going through matching the handbook so it matches the MASC handbook as close as possible. I mean, we can veer off and do our own thing, but a lot of these are just, they're legal jargon, Clean following up. compliance yeah. with laws or, or, or making sure. They're really good at helping us make sure our policies cross-reference because there you go. if you ever looked at our policy handbook, it's a three binder printed. You don't really want conflict in your policies. Nope. Uh, do you want to talk about the re policies proposing to remove? So sure. The removal ones, again, if they if it wasn't in the MASC and we couldn't recognize the need for it, we removed it. So some of these may have been lurking around, I'll be honest with you, from before, um, you know, Ed Reform in 1993. I mean, some of these could be really old. Um, First one was administrative reports. Basically, you can request any administrative report you want from the from the administration as a school committee. Um, it's not part of the document, it's not needed. Um, enrollment projections, FFBB, I mean FBB, is not part of master MASC. Those enrollment projections we were getting from NASDAQ were have been off forever and we stopped paying the, paying the yearly uh, subscription because it was not worth the information they were giving us. But um, we do enrollment projections by birth counts and what we can get from our sending preschools. GA is personnel policies and goals. It's not part of the master MASC, um, but we do personnel policies and goals. We do have our equity goals, which we talked about around hiring and, and so forth. So that kind of it does slide in there and actually does more than that, what we're replacing there. Um, GCCD is domestic violence leave policy. Um, it's legally has been changed and no longer is recommended by MASC. There's still laws out there that um, protect under FMLA and um, other things like that, but they're saying that that policy is out of date. Um, GDQD, um, the suspension and dismissal of support staff members um, is not needed. There is a process that we follow that's found in the collective bargaining agreements and in the staff handbooks. Um, GCQE, the retirement of professional staff members is not, it's not part of the master agreement. It's not needed, basically just allows people to hire, it's kind of silly. Um, G, GDQC is another one removing um, retirement of support staff members. Again, they can retire. We don't need a policy on that. H is negotiations. It's a bunch of filler language. If you read it, there's no need for it. Part of it is not part of MASC. JBA student to student harassment. Well, you say, wow, why are you getting rid of that? But it's actually it's being covered under sexual harassment, bullying prevention, harassment of students, um, and also non discrimination policy, including harassment and retaliation. So all student student harassments are now found underneath those policies. JHBBA public absence notification. Um, program policy, again, not part of the master one, um, and our attendance policies can be found in our handbooks, which is approved by school committee. JHC, religious holidays, can now be found under JH, um, and JH, I believe, is absences, so in there, they have all your reasons for absences, including religious holidays, so you don't need to have a section, separate one, nor is it recommended. And the last one, JKA, um, no, you can't do corporal punishment. Um, again, that's, it'd be nice that we have to have that, but um, it's kind of an old one. if I have to refer to the policy, um, when you're helping a student, um, yeah, yeah. they removed it. I think it probably causes more confusion than yeah. not. All right. Alrighty. 
So we're going to review those and vote on them next um, meeting. Uh, and most of those sound like formalities, but yeah. still, it's always interesting to review them. Also remember that the committee is going through every single policy in each of these letter groups. And if there's nothing of substantial change, they're calling it reviewed and they're updating the review date. So That's excellent. Not every single one is being re is being voted on. And if there's any minor changes, like they got, you know, they're making pronouns general, they instead of he, she, um, they're not sending that in front of you folks either. Excellent. Okay. All righty. On to FY25 budget. Shelly, take it away. All right. I'm going to share my screen. I did send you out the budget presentation. Um, as I said in my email, this is different format than you're used to seeing. Um, more information will be coming as we go through the budget process, including a line by line budget. Um, especially we'll make sure that the town gets those materials because we know they like to see all of that. <clears throat> Can everyone see the screen? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so what I want to say to start us off is that we have a pretty easy budget year, I think. I, I don't think this is going to be anything exciting. Knock on something. <laughs> Knock on wood. Um, I know we like boring budget conversations, so uh, we'll see if we can get through this quickly and, and pretty painlessly, I think. Um, but just to give us a recap of last year, we adopted a budget of 2.36% increase. As a reminder, we presented 3.36 to um, the public during our public hearing, and the town uh, let us know at that time any additional support that the school could provide. So we actually reduced the budget by uh, about a percentage point, 21,000, and paid some expenditures from ESSER to bring us down to 2.36. So we're coming off of what, what I feel was a decent budget year and also relatively easy and um, not problematic. So looking at 25, um, budget timeline quickly, just to review. Uh, these are the upcoming meetings uh, in February, March. We have two meetings. We will have our public hearing on March 14th and then the vote on March 28th. And I did put the town meeting date in there. I believe it is June 1st, but I didn't see it publicized yet, which is why I put the one in parentheses, but typically it is that first Saturday in June. So uh, this is just so that you all have it on your radar. We haven't talked about timeline yet. so. Uh, just so you have that. And uh, a little bit about budget development. So uh, when we start the budget building process, we make sure that we're looking at a needs-based student-centered budget while also being fiscally responsible. Uh, we gather feedback from key stakeholders and school leadership. So that goes down to you know, the principal soliciting feedback from staff, uh, as well as me talking to other directors or administrators, so uh, facilities, IT, special education, you know, making sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and that we have all of these <clears throat> accounted for. The first step of the budget process is always to look at level services, which just as a quick reminder, doesn't mean that we have level funding. Level services always comes with an expense because you're looking at your existing staffing and programming, and that will always account for um, contractual wage obligations that are due uh, to any contract employees, as well as raises for non-contract, and then adjustments for any expense accounts that have previously been over in prior years, or uh, just to account for inflation, which is what we're dealing with right now pretty heavily. Um, the final part of the uh, process with budget building is to look at new initiatives, uh, make sure that any new needs at the school are being met and being accounted for, at least in this initial conversation. Doesn't mean that they're always going to get approved, but we want to add those in while we're having these first draft discussions. And then we look at revolving funds as well to make sure that our grants and revolving funds can cover all expenditures. Um, I'm not going to read through this, but I thought that it was good to give you this info, not only for looking ahead to 25, but all the budget reports you'll see, they have these function codes on them. And I wanted you to have an idea of what those function codes mean. These expense categories are set by DESE. Um, so there's there's about six categories or five or six categories that we use for Conway's budget, district administration, instruction, which is anything directly related to teaching and learning. So that's teaching staff, paras, 
um, library uh, supplies and materials, PD, anything in that 2000 category directly relates to student teaching and learning. Pupil services, uh, function codes 300, that would be the nurse's office, uh, transportation, food service, um, athletics, which really only pertains to the high school, student activities pertains to the high school as well, um, and any of our building security. Physical plant and operations and maintenance are the function code in the 4000 series. Benefits and fixed charges are 5,000, and then out-of-district placements are the 9,000 function codes. And what I want to say about those last two is that benefits and fixed charges are relatively low for Conway because the town covers school benefits. So there's not a significant expense there. Um, if you are looking at Frontier's budget, you will see in that presentation the piece of the pie for those expense categories is much larger because we're talking about you know, over a million dollars just for health and dental insurance alone. Um, and then out of district placement, Conway is very fortunate to have a thriving um, special education program. So we don't have to have out of district placement conversations very regularly. I'm not sure that we've had one conversation in at least the five years that I've been here. So um, kudos to, to Kristen for building a great program and all the special ed team that works with our students. Um, a little bit of a little bit more history and information here for you. So generally speaking, uh, about 75 percent of the budget is made up of expenses related to instruction. Budget drivers are primarily salary and wages, not only in this category, but also in central office. Those are primarily expenditures. Um, for salaries and wages. Facilities and operations is the second largest piece of the pie. So that is our, our building maintenance and all of our utility costs, transportation and special education. Those are always big budget drivers. Uh, transportation and special education. While on one hand, we don't have out of district, we might need additional IAs for one-to-ones for IEPs or you know other um, support services. So that's still a big piece of the pie for Conway and transportation is through the roof district wide. Uh, we are seeing uh, rates primarily for special education over $300 a day. So, you know, they're definitely things that we're looking at in this initial phase of the budget conversation. All right, so let's talk about the actual budget and what fiscal year 25 preliminarily, at least at this point, looks like. So going back to that level service budget where we replicate all of our staffing and all of our current services and existing programs, plug all, all of our wage increases in, analyze the non-wage expenditures, looking at prior three-year history to account for any changes that might be made, um, looking also at grant and revolving fund adjustments in this first step of the process. So you can see there that we're looking at just over a $90,000 wage increase, which is the largest chunk of that 4.6, I'm sorry, 5.6% increase. Um, $90,000 for Conway is almost that full 5%. So that's a significant number, um, primarily driven this year by a couple of things. Uh, we have a significant unit A increase. Uh, there's two teachers, one is stepping to step 14, uh, which when you do that, you sit at step 14 until you hit the longevity and your after completion of your 19th year. So the raise in that or the step in that um, number is more significant than it is at the lower steps. So steps, oh, is it? I can't remember. I think we start at three in the elementary schools, right? Yeah. So it's three through um, 13, the step is 3.19% on the 2%. So staff will see a 5.19% age increase. If you are hitting step 14, it is over that 5.19%. It's actually over 10%. Um, and then we have a couple of other adjustments that are happening on the teacher contract based on where people are on the salary schedule next year that's making the bump a little bit higher. Some of that might be related to column movement. So if somebody has advanced their degree and they're moving into a different column, that also always increases the step. Uh, we had talked about this early in the fall. The next item on here, I gave you a heads up 
early, early in the budget season. It might have been October, or even November, um, where I did let you know that five members of the Unit A contract had elected to opt into the longevity benefit of 4000 per year for three years. So we are seeing that increase uh, in next fiscal year. And this is one of the things that some could argue you may be able to find another funding source. You know, if this were employee separation costs, you know, it's sort of a one time expense. But with longevity, because it's three years, we really need it as a placeholder. Otherwise, we're going to be in the same boat next year looking to fund that twenty thousand dollars in another way. So it's thrown in here at level services. All of your unit C staff are paid. So that's all your paraprofessionals. Um, or if you had any CODAs or PTAs, which we don't in Conway, but they fall into that category of the contract. Um, all of those staff are paid from another funding source. So when I say zero, this is just in regards to the general fund budget. That doesn't mean those staff are not receiving a wage increase. They 100% are. The COLA on that contract is 2%. The step varies in the IA contract. It's not as stable as the teacher contract. So the raise probably could be for the step between three and 5% on top of the two, depending on where someone is. So I just want to make sure that that's really clear, that it doesn't mean that our paras are not receiving a raise. They they absolutely, all IAs are going to receive um, the wage increase that they're due. It just means that there's no impact to the general fund because we pay all of our IAs from another funding source. School-based staff is the placeholder we have built in right now for anyone who's at the school level. So secretaries, principals, cafeteria, anyone along those lines. And then central office. Um, this is a pretty steep increase for central office, uh, which is primarily related to Conway's enrollment being uh, seeing growth in the cost share percentage in relation to the rest of the district. So while some of the other schools might be going down, if Conway's going up, they're not only going to see an increase because enrollment is growing, but that ratio of who's who's continuing to grow um, is going to climb. So there's a, over a one and a half percent increase in cost share central office expenditures. So that's a pretty significant number there. Any questions about wages before I keep going? Okay, non-wage, did I miss somebody? No, I just said makes sense. Okay, perfect. Um, non-wage increases, so this is some of what I already talked about. Contract services is up, trash removal is up. And when I say up, right now the trash is only over by a couple hundred dollars. By the end of the year, we anticipate that to be over budget by probably 1,500 to 2,000. So you start to add up all these little amounts and you know, we, we could find ways to fund this, but it's time to right side the budget. The market's not going to shift dramatically down, even if, you know, we see things starting to turn and inflation decreases. Um, our contractors aren't going to give us a discount. They're not going to change their prices just because the market changed. So we really need to have adequate funds to cover those operating expenses for the school. The other thing that's in here is a placeholder for a transportation increase because our contract is up for renewal next year. So Darius and I are anticipating that we're not only going to see growth in the contract, but there'll be COLA year to year that we have to build in. So that is in there as well in that 11000 which is um, about a half a percent. $11,000 is roughly a half percent. And then revolving funds and grants. So as I explained in FY24, um, to bring that budget to 2.36%, we put 21,000 on ESSER. I'm estimating in this based on what we've paid um, with that grant so far that 18,000 would automatically come back to budget as we look at level services. Um, we're gonna make some recommendations to use ESSER fund to bring this number down because 5.6 is not a comfortable number. I don't think for anyone um, in the room right now <laughs> or the town, you know, knowing some of the circumstances that they're facing currently with um, road repairs and, and things like that. We definitely want to work to bring that number down. So while I'm talking about adding it back in, we are going to propose taking it out. Um, let's keep going. So the next step, as I explained, we always look at new needs requests and initiatives. So these 
requests this year. Last year, Kristen didn't have any new requests. She felt like school committee had supported us enough in the past where the school could be steady and stable and we could really do um, provide the best education with what we had. Uh, looking ahead to next year, there's just a couple of things that we're looking to increase. It's, it's not even a half of a percent. Um, and they're all valid expenditures. So field trips, that is primarily related to equity and access. More and more families are needing um, support to send their students on field trips, particularly the uh, sixth grade trip to nature's classroom. Uh, and transportation costs for field trip has also gone up. So that expense is in there. Curriculum consumables is related to the new curriculum pieces that we're rolling out. Uh, we did look at what we're spending in the past on consumables for the prior curriculum and made adjustments because there's always going to be things that we can swap out, um, but there is some additional costs that we're looking at moving forward. And then principal's office supplies and materials is primarily just related to inflation. So things that Kristen buys routinely throughout the year, whether it's for um, staff appreciation or um, staff PD support, you know, that kind of thing. If she's running any games during meetings or providing a meal or anything like that, or even just, you know, swag for staff just to show the appreciation. So that's primarily related to those line items. How about that, Elaine? I'm asking for something. <laughs> I was going to comment on that and I'm very happy and they're very reasonable requests. <laughs> totally not out of line at all. Sure. And it's good to keep them in mind because, you know, you don't want students to not have those opportunities and to have what they need, you know. So, yes, I think that's great. All right. So the next slide is titled administrative recommendations, although it really could be titled options because, you know, this is school committee's budget. So Darius and I can lead you a certain way, but, you know, however you want to handle it, um, we'll take your guidance and advice. So we're recommending reducing the budget by about 3%. Uh, the first piece is, obviously, we agree with Elaine. Elaine just said Kristen's requests are very reasonable. They're needed. They're not even really new requests or initiatives. It's really kind of just adjusting the budget to where it needs to be to, to fund those things. Um, so we fully support that. And then the next bullet point here, we have a placeholder in the budget of 21,000 for employee separation costs, which is related to retirement and the unit A contract. We're recommending that we move that because we do not have any retirees in fiscal year 25, but we don't want to lose it as a placeholder. So we could hold that 20,000 ish um, in school choice for future use so that it's in there as an existing line item. If we don't use it, the money rolls over to the next year, but at least we have it earmarked unless we get, you know, another crazy year where we have three, four retirees, we don't have to go back to the town and ask for funding. We have it already set up as our safety net in school choice. Uh, so that's the first recommendation, which is an easy one because there isn't an expense related to it next year. So let's save that 1%, move it on school choice and, and leave it there for now. Get it off the budget. And Conway's staff is fairly young now, right? Well, we do have um, the four earlier career or mid, early mid. Yeah. The ones that just requested longevity. Typically, when you request longevity, you're in your last three to five years of employment because you're boosting up your salary because that counts towards your pension. So I do think we could be looking at some retirees in the nearer future, not next year, maybe, but next few budget cycles. OK. Yeah. Um. So the next recommendation is to move $30,000 of general fund expenditures onto ESSER. This is more than we paid in FY24 on ESSER. And it's not really a place that Darius and I like going to because we don't want to put recurring expenses on a grant that's going to go away. And this grant does go away next September. However, there is about $65,000 left in Conway's ESSER funding. So one, we want to make sure we spend it down um, because we don't want to lose that money. And two, 
we feel like we have enough waters on the inside of the door. Sorry, one of my kids has a friend over and he's standing in the kitchen looking at me like, where can I get a drink of water? <laughs> um, he was trying to be really polite about it, but sorry. No problem. <laughs> Um, we, we're going to talk about revolving fund balances here in a little bit. And we, we both, Darius and I both feel like while we, on one hand, we're saying don't load up Esser uh, with, re, with re, recurring expenditures because eventually they're going to fall back to budget. We feel like we have a plan to cover those expenses in the future. That's not going to have a negative impact on the general fund for at least a few years anyway. So we're going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, and then rural aid. We really haven't talked much about rural aid. Uh, early on, we mentioned it. We don't have the numbers. We don't have the numbers yet. I think at the last meeting, I did let you all know that we had finally received our award amount. And I believe Conway is about 26000 We do not have any, uh, any earmarks for that grant currently. And ideally, if rural aid works out the way that the state wants it to, it becomes the offset for districts like ours that are not seeing a significant increase in chapter 78 because we're in that hold harmless status. Um, so it is most fiscally responsible for us to use that, those funds to help offset the budget. And we're recommending a 1% uh, decrease to the budget with rural aid. In the past, when we've received rural aid, um, it's been about half as much of what Conway has currently received. And we've used it as more of a a slush fund end of year kind of spending and said, hey, Kristen, what do we need that's not in budget and what can we buy to support the school with these funds? Given the amount of funding in the current year and if they continue to grow that as it's predicted to do, uh, it really makes sense to help use that to offset our budget. So bottom line, looking at all of these pieces, uh, we would be at 2.69% if we move forward with all of these adjustments as Darius and I are laying out as options for you to consider. Questions about that before I keep going? Okay. Is this similar to the other schools in terms of you know, covering costs and increases to the town? Uh, yeah, I, it, we are seeing with level services, I think there's maybe one school that's under 4% right now. Okay. Of maybe two of the five budgets are under 4% at level services. So um, when your COLA increases plus your steps are 5% for most of your staff, it, you can't start off under that 3%. It's just not yeah. possible. So other funding sources are really important, especially in a small budget, because $20,000 is 1%. You can, yeah, it adds up really quickly. Yeah. yeah and I also think the uh, using the rural aid to pull that in at 1%. I mean, if they reduce that, hopefully, I don't think they're going to chop it up all the way. If they reduce it slightly, the idea is that they don't reduce it more than 1% or else we're going to, that's the only risk there is that there's no guarantee that we'll get rural aid at 26,000 next year. But I think the governor, I think she would level fund it. And we will know that because the governor's budget is coming out on the 24th. So we'll know that prior to approving this budget, of what she's recommending for the rural aid numbers. So it will and be I thought that was a big aid. promise of her whole thing was rural aid, rural, rural aid. Right. And we'll see, even see if she's recommending it to go up. I, given the state's finances, I think it's going to be level funded, but we'll see. All right. Keeping us moving here. Um, enrollment. Um, so here's our enrollment. I'm not going to read through all these classes. You guys can read through that on your own. Um, we do have one section per grade. It, I think it is worth the comment that school choice is about 35% of our enrollment. Um, without that, I'm not sure what Conway Grammar School would look like. Classes would be significantly smaller than they are. Um, but this is projections for next year based on the October 1st enrollment. Uh, a couple of other things to note here is that we have 19.4 uh, FTEs on the Unit A contract. So the teacher contract, 
uh, that's eight grade level, and then uh, 11.4 other, so um, art, PE, library, music, nurse guidance, um, all of our related services, special education teachers. Uh, and then we currently have 18 IAs, uh, so a total of uh, 37.4 FTEs in the building. Can I ask a question? Or yeah, of course. I'm just noticing that kindergarten has a lot more residents to school choice, right? So it's, it's like kind of a bubble, I guess, right? Compared to the older grades. So some of that might be deceiving, although I don't think so, Kristen. That came from uh, Kim directly. <laughs> Uh, Kim McCarthy, our early childhood director. And I think your pre-K is almost, your current pre-K is almost all moving up and they're almost all residents. Is that right, Kristen? Correct. Yeah. So yeah, there is a bit of a bubble there. Right. I was just thinking about how for the upper classes that have smaller residencies, we have more room for school choice. Yeah. And that incoming fund versus, you know, as, as that kindergarten moves into third grade in a few years, we may just have less space for school choice students. So, yeah, Michael, we, um, you know, every year we do it literally grade by grade. And you might see a low number in one grade and say, hmm, why didn't they open up more school choice um, openings? There's usually a real reason behind that could be the makeup of the students or whatever um but we do offer school choice to all we have offered school choice to all the grades um the other thing i was going to say school choice works here because we don't have to add any extra uh, classrooms or anything like that because of school choice students if that were the case then it might not might not benefit i don't i don't know if i just answered your question well, i'm just noticing that well, what's what's the cap for our class, like a grade level size? Is it you mentioned some of it depends on the uh, makeup of the particular grade level cohort, but um, I'm just noticing so, we may if we have more in town students, we may have less space for school choice in the future. Correct. Correct. But Michael, I think you bring up a good point in the sense if you look at uh, fifth and sixth grade, right? So you got 20, you know, you got 24 students sitting there where, and you look at kindergarten and PK, it's six. So you're basically going to drop school choice, you know, um, by 18 students, 18 times five, right? That's what you get on school choice before the, you know, sped increment um, there. So you are going to start losing, you're going to see a tremendous loss in revenue in school choice in the next few years, unless we, cause you're only going to be able to backfill so much. I mean, our, our prime, our prime number space is, you know, 18 to 22, um, with a little bit, like a little bit less at the lower grades, if possible, you know, we, we work with what we yep. got, especially when they're town residents, but, and, and then some of those other class room, just cause there's room doesn't mean there's somebody wanting to go into that. If you don't get them in their first couple of years, you may not, not a whole lot of people like, hey, let's move fourth grade, you know. Um, if they are, usually there's, you know, stuff going on at the other school or something like that kind of thing, so. Yeah, it is a really good point, Michael. Yeah, even next year we're projected to be down three, right? Because the sixth grade class that is exiting has high rate of school choice students. So we're already projecting a decline from this year to next year. Depending on what we receive for applications. Yeah, we already have about uh, 10 applications. I don't even think we've put word out yet. Are they included in the projection or no? No. Okay. No, for this is just based, just based on the um, October 1 enrollments. Jared, our goal is a good point, too. Our goal always is to um, capture whatever we're losing in whatever we're losing in sixth grade for school choice we always want to be at least at that number um and if we we can take more which in this case we can in many grades 
we take more but we always that's always sort of a the target is at least the number of school choice sixth graders that are leaving and just to remind folks timeline wise so we have it scheduled i'm looking at our i have an agenda with all our business we do at all our school committee meetings um, march is when we do our school choice approval so you will have you'll be making school choice approval for how many slots or in what general idea of who's before the final vote of this budget so you'll have it you'll have you'll have, not that it should be the riding factor but if there is concern there you'll have that information to come back around in march okay. can you guys hear me yep yes oh, okay my my phone died so i had to call in on a thing called the landline <laughs> <laughs> well I'm not sure um, everybody knows what it is but i do still have one <laughs> anyway okay any more enrollment questions before we keep moving all right we've got up those points thank you for that all right, so the next thing we wanted to look at quickly, just the rest of this is really informational. Um, so revolving funds and grants, as I said, always support the budget. Uh, you can see here on the left side of this slide that Conway relies very heavily on revolving funds and school choice uh, to cover expenditures. Even IDEA is over 1%, which is a special education grant that's over 1% of the budget. So we are spending just shy of 750,000 as projected right now from revolving funds and grants on the school's total operating costs. So we're really looking at a total operating budget of about 3 million with this offset. So um, obviously, if we're talking about school choice numbers going down, although I don't see, think we'll see a big impact for at least a few years with that kindergarten bubble, um, you know, we do have a significant number to cover there. And then special education revolving, uh, those expenses also, we have to make sure that the students that we're tuitioning in cover all of the expenses that are paid out of there. So it is a pretty significant number in Conway, more than some of the other elementary schools for sure. Uh, other funds, just to consider, there there won't be any circuit breaker reimbursement that has to do with special education and expenses, um, primarily outside of district because there's a threshold number there that the state reimburses on. The ESSER balance is there for you to consider as we talk about using some of that to fund budget, rural aid, and then FY25 is subject to appropriation. Next, I'm going to give you the revolving fund balances. Uh, not going to go over these line by line. Uh, Conway is pretty stable in its revolving funds, especially compared to some of the other smaller elementary schools. And when I say stable, meaning expenses are not exceeding revenue in the way that we're seeing in some of the other districts. Um, while school choice were exceeding revenue, the projections are always conservative here. This is before any special education increment claims might come in. We actually are predicted this year to receive about 280,000. Um, I tend to err on the side of caution and, and make sure that we are not over projecting revenue. So um, with a balance of 542,000, I do not foresee us having a problem covering that $20,000 for employee separation costs that we talked about as a placeholder, particularly given that here we don't actually have that expense. So the, those funds should be there to fund uh, fiscal year 26 and moving forward. And also uh, with ESSER, where I had talked about, you know, we don't like to put recurring expenses on a grant that's going to go away. But if we do not have any other options in 26, we feel like school choice has a healthy balance. You're talking about almost two years of reserves built here. But we could use some of those funds to help supplement the budget with, if there's no other options with us or gone. Any questions about revolving funds? And these are just projections. I, you know, I'm. It's always a guessing game right now because we don't know who's going to enroll in the early childhood program at this point. Applications just went out. So, you know, we'll have more information as we go through the budget process. Although it, we're close here, you know, we're not off by 50,000 in each of the revolving funds. We might be off 10 or 15, but um, I tend to be conservative on the revenue and go high on the expenses just to make sure that pieces are covered. Questions? 
All right, I have just a couple more slides here uh, before I'm done. Um, one of which is, oh, I can't get my slide. Uh, just historical information for you. You can see Conway has been in really good shape with its budget numbers going to the town for years. Uh, we've had that one year where we were well over 3%, but we've been historically under for the last few. So I feel like we're in good shape uh, moving into the future. And quick recap before we talk about next steps. Um, so we talked about those budget drivers, um, wages, facilities, and maintenance, special education and transportation. Uh, three quarters of the budget helps support instructional services for teaching and learning. Um, and then I'm giving you the information here for level services as a reminder, the new request, and uh, our recommendation, which is moving employee separation cost to school choice for, as a placeholder, spending down about half of what remains in ESSER to support the budget, and then funding 1% of the budget with rural aid. Shelly, the, the dollar increase line does, does reflects the full dollar amount, but the budget does not, right? It's not? Uh, no, because if you, if you subtracted the two columns, it's only the... Mm, whatever would equate to the 2.69% increase versus 128K would be closer to that five plus. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, I'll double check the... So something there is just not quite holding hand. That's not adding up right. The 2.69 uh, is the correct increase though, if we make those correct. three reductions, so. Yep. Okay, I'll fix that for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so next steps is, is the last piece of this conversation. Um, Darius and I don't need you to give us any further direction tonight, uh, unless there was something that, you know, you're fully on board with and want us to move ahead, um, for the next meeting, for example, yes, move the school choice, uh, the employee separation cost of school choice. That's a no brainer. We don't have any expenses there um, next year. So why not put it in as a placeholder? I'll go ahead and make that adjustment. Um, yes, rural aid, that's easy peasy. We don't have that earmarked for anything. Um, or if you wanna sit on this and give us more direction in February, that's fine too. Um, and then as we go through the process, we'll add in more materials. There'll be a line by line budget coming, um, a full narrative so that everyone who uh, is seeing this gets the full picture as we move through the process. Darius, did I miss anything? Or Kristen, did I miss anything? Nope, I think you're fine. I think, you know, between now and the next meeting, we also, as, as I mentioned, we get the governor's budget. I, I bet you she'll be on time with the 24th. So it's coming in the, the January 24th. So we'll have that. That means we'll have an idea where the town is. The town should also know what it got for flood um, assistance or we got the, the weather so assistance. Yeah. So they should have an idea there. So, you know, um, the demands on the school from the town's point of view should be somewhat in focus as well. So I think, you know, some of this is wait and see. So if we use the uh, teacher retirement, whatever it's called there, it, does it keep adding up so we're in good shape, like when we do have multiple retirements or is it use it, lose it? I can't remember what you said. So we would hold that 20 or 21,000 on school choice as a placeholder, which would basically fund one teacher retirement. And okay. if we did have multiple in one year, we would have to have a conversation about how we're funding that, whether we're asking the town for support, if we're going to throw another teacher on school choice, um, we'd have to see what the revolving funds look at at that time. But at least for now, we would have a plan to have one retirement payout covered in the near future, should we need it. It feels safe to you to do that. It does. Yeah. Yeah. In, in other towns, we've, We've many times pulled that out of the budget and asked for the town to pay for it separately because it doesn't, you're not increasing your budget and increasing your yearly expenses. If we didn't have the revolving accounts, it's one way of doing it is basically, um, you know, put it on the warrant for free cash because it's one of their employee obligations. So we haven't had to do that recently. Did we do it a few years ago in Conway? We do it all the time in the other towns, so though. We pull it what? out, pull out the uh, separation costs. In, out in, of the budget. Pull it out and give it the, and have the town paper it separately. Off yeah. Um, 
Conway hasn't had a placeholder in the past. That was a shift that we threw in. So last year we did have the retirement and we were going to pay that from ESSER. But when you do that, you also have to pay a 9% fee to MTRS. So we didn't want to lose that 9% fee. So we paid some um, non -op or non salary expenses on ESSER. So this is new in the Conway budget that it's been in there as a holding place. Um, okay. Wheatley does not have it built in at all. Deerfield does because it's more regular for them. Frontier yep. does because it's more regular for them. Sunderland doesn't either. So, I also really like the narrative at the beginning, and I think people should keep that, school committee members should keep that close at hand so people understand the process we go through is very thoughtful. It's not willy-nilly. You know, we don't throw money at things. You know, um, I mean, m my push has always been, you know, it's the gem of the town. We need to take care of it. We need to be good stewards of it. So, you know, let's not, you know, let it go to rot, you know, but that's not, oh, I just throw money at things. That's like a very thoughtful, you know, and school choice. You know, we're, a, we have a very educated in general parents who want the best education for their kids. You know, so we have to, you know, know what we have to to offer them, you know, and have it be high quality. So, you know, talk with your friends and they, that's our, that's our strategy. Any other questions for Shelly at this point? Yep. All righty. Um, so mull this over and we'll be back at it. The process is. We go over it again next month. When does um, uh, the other members of town, chair, uh, finance committee, and et cetera, look at this? So the public hearing is in March, if they want to do that. Um, basically, um, I usually have a conversation with the town administrators about what's going on. Yep. You know, given that it's a pretty uneventful budget, I mean, they're going to, we're going to know where Conway stands at the end of this month. Uh, hopefully, when they see what their what their numbers are coming from the state, and then if they get what kind of flood support they they get. Um, but this is not one where the finance key is. Going to, I don't think it's going to come marching and demand an explanation. <laughs> so and we'll send out materials to Veronique ahead of time so she can pass them along to select board and finance committee too. Once we get you know, more finalized and it's usually, yeah, it's usually after the February meeting, yeah. we start saying, Hey, this is the numbers. This is where we're kind of landing and ahead of the, ahead of the, uh, uh, the, uh, rain, rain just left me, um, mm -hmm. public hearing instead of the rain from the public hearing, we make sure they all have it. And that's why many times they don't show up because it's an acceptable budget percentage wise. Right. Which is a good place to be. Yeah, it's, good. it's a good problem to have. Yep, we like that problem. All righty, thank you very much, Shelley, for the detail and the thoroughness and the thoughtfulness. We appreciate that. Um, I don't, do we have any committee reports? It would only be that Kristen gave us her report. Um, Denise sent us a collaborative update after the last meeting. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people had time to take a look at that. Um, well, they're celebrating their 50th year. Yeah. Um, last last board meeting, we finalized or approved the board approved the annual report, the audit, and the financial statements for FY23. And we're going to be meeting at the end of the month again this month. Um, yeah, and you do have that executive director's report, so it's a yeah, lot to weed through, but <laughs> you do have it. <laughs> a lot, but it's interesting. I mean, yeah. Michael, especially being an educator, their website's know. great too. Yeah, they really. really great website so yep awesome yeah uh and darius gave us a lot of information tonight he doesn't need to give us another report all right i think we're ready for a motion to adjourn yeah there's a my, motion yeah, there's my prince my superintendent's report you guys should have got that right yeah we got we got slammed that's why we got a lot of things this month i think it was overwhelmed with the policies but you know gotta keep you on your toes Keep you yeah. working. Yeah. All right. All righty. So motion to adjourn. A motion. Second.
second? Second. All right, the dog seconded. Yeah, I will. <laughs> that's my dog. <laughs> Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.